Okay. Okay, so uh, happy to be with you. Uh, it is a great thing that uh, technological development is here and uh, we can we can talk to each other uh, from Korea to Kenya. This is just simply amazing. I think this is the fulfillment of the Lord's uh, uh, word that um, the gospel will go to the end of the world. Now, man cannot go to the end of the world, but now this uh, internet can go. Internet can go to the rest of the whole world. And I'm so happy to be with you, uh, pastors. I was asked to talk about uh, church growth. And uh, as you see on the TTP slide, the theme, which I said, the church growth is the will of God. I think the pastors has to remember this very clearly and never forget that church will march on. And uh, growing church is, is the will of God. God wants the church to grow. And uh, whether you are part of a big church, a small church, or planting church, you are part of that church growth. And this is the will of God. We are following and doing the will of God. I wanted to talk about, uh, first of all, salvation growth. Well, wow, that's a little uh, unfamiliar uh, expression, but if we read the entire Bible, mm, Bible everywhere, particularly like in Matthew chapter 20, 19, 20, go therefore make disciples of all nations. The whole world is to be evangelized and salvation expansion, I expand to the whole world starting from Jerusalem and says, baptize, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus, this is the one of the last words Jesus gave to us. And we are in the process of uh, the salvation goes everywhere in the whole world. Because the purpose of Jesus coming to this world is John 3, 21. God did not send his son to condemn the world. There is no need to condemn the world because the world is already condemned because of the sin. Uh, somebody's already condemned. Why do we need to condemn the, uh, the sinners? Uh, we just don't need to. Jesus came through him might be saved. The world may be saved. The salvation is the issue. This salvation should go to everyone. Everyone should be hear the gospel of Christ and it will grow. And uh, so this is the will of God. And Matthew 6, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants the church planted and church grow until the day of the last trumpet sound when the angels blow the last trumpet for the second coming of Christ. It will continue to grow. Uh, church may increase, diminish in one area, but it doesn't matter, but it will continue on. And then you remember Second Peter chapter three, verse one says that, uh, God is not willing to uh, God is not willing to anyone to perish, he said. No one should there's no reason why a man or woman should be perishing. There's no need for that because Jesus came and he accomplished salvation when he said it is finished, our sins has been paid off. There's no more need for us, anyone to pay for 
anything to earn the salvation. Salvation is free, heaven's door is wide open, and everyone should be saved. It is very sad if, if a member of our family is not saved, which is very sad. Um, I've been a pastor for many years since 19, what, what is that? 1969. And uh, I pastored a small church, a mid-sized church and, and big churches. Uh, I've, I've done that, but my, my ultimate goal was preach the gospel so clearly that nobody misunderstand, nobody uh, doesn't understand. They all understand. Only the ones who cannot go to heaven is who refuse to go. I don't want to go. I don't like heaven. I don't like God. I don't like Jesus Christ. Well, then there's no, 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 nothing we can do to help them. However, if they understand the gospel clearly, because we can, we we express it or communicate uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly. In my experience, most of the people accepted Jesus Christ. When when we say just oh come to our church or oh pastor is great why don't you come and and meet him, if you talk about that there may be not be the salvation but if you present the gospel of Jesus Christ, that whole world may be saved. And if they understand it clearly, it's always the people will come to Christ. I would say I, I try to reach out to the people, as many as possible, uh, individually in a group and the churches and things like that. But I have noticed that Whenever I present the gospel clearly, somebody come to Jesus Christ. I, I've never seen any time when I was, when I wanted to preach the gospel of salvation, I have not experienced anything that nobody came to Jesus Christ. So salvation is free, is the grace of God, and eternal life is uh, absolute free gift from God to everyone who hear of Jesus Christ. So um, this is what God wants, and uh, uh, we will see the people coming to Christ, wherever the people come to Christ, there will be a church, and that church will grow once it's started. And God is not willing to with anybody to perish, but all come to the repentance and be saved. This is the will of God. It grows uh, numerically uh, because uh, it, it, it starts somewhere and it starts spreading to the rest of the world. So uh, it will grow, uh, the salvation will grow numerically. Uh, go to next uh, slide. And uh, I think this is, that's what I said, numerical growth. <clears throat> you know, Acts chapter 240, verse 7, it says, uh, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. Somebody will be saved who are being saved. You remember, Jesus started with uh, two people, Simon Peter and James. Uh, Andrew, Peter and Andrew, the first disciple was only two. And they introduced to, then Jesus reached out to James and J James and John's two became four and became 12. And then we read a record of Jesus sending 72 people two by two to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. So church is growing numerically. And then we see 120 people in an upper room. And then 500 people watched Jesus ascending into heaven. And we know that uh, uh, 3,000 people were saved when St. Peter uh, preached the gospel. And then 
uh, we also read about uh, 4,000 people are fed by Jesus Christ. And then he said that I am the bread of life, he said. Hmm. If you eat this bread, you will be hungry again. If you drink this water, you will be thirsty again. But if you drink of me, you shall live forever. So as you can see, 2, 4, 12, 70, 120, 50, 3,000, 4,000 now into the whole world. Now, one third of the entire human population at least claim to be Christian. Right, quite interesting. It, church grows. It's, this is the will of God. And uh, this will be true with us and our ministries as well. And then not only numerical growth, but uh, there's a geographical growth as well. Acts 1.8, you will receive the power of the wind, the Holy Spirit come on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You start where you are. And then you go to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Yes, we, we are reaching out to the end of the world. It's called the missions, world missions. So it spread where you are and then gradually wider and wider and wider as your church grow, you get involved with the world missions. You send your missionaries out there and plant a church and preach the gospel. Geographically, it will grow. Yeah. So it will start with the salvation, but salvation is merely the start. Numerically, as well as geographically, but once you are saved, you have a spiritual growth. When you are first a Christian, when someone accepts Jesus Christ, he's just born again. Even if he's a 50 years old man come to Jesus Christ, he's only one day old. He has to grow spiritually. He may be a famous movie star, but he will, he's only one day old, and you have to help him to grow. The spiritual growth is the next step to salvation. Salvation is, uh, I would say, salvation is the easiest. It was the hardest for God, hardest for Jesus Christ. But uh, salvation is so free that anybody can be saved. All you can say is after you hear the gospel of Christ and about Jesus Christ and his, his death and burial and resurrection, accomplish the eternal life, you know, then. All you can say is thank you. That's all we human beings can say for salvation. It's a free. The day we meet Jesus Christ and hear the gospel and invited Christ into our heart as our personal Savior and the Lord, and we are born again. It is very important that every person whether individually or as a group, they hear the gospel. They have, they have to understand the gospel clearly, what Christ has done for them. And then they are born and they are born again. Not everyone is born again. This is the problem of the church. Uh, recently, not only during the uh, pandemic, uh, uh, Years, last three years, and uh, the churches could not meet in the church. And now some of the people left the church, they say, and don't come back. Well, there's no such a thing. You may change from one church to another church. That is possible, but no born again Christian cannot leave his family. Because he's born again, he's born. Now, uh, uh, you know, my parents um, uh, are very much blessed and they had uh, nine children. 
and uh, five boys and four girls. And uh, nine of us siblings, we are family. You know, you cannot deny that we are the members of family. And even if you leave home or you deny your parents, your siblings, you're still my family because you're born of my parents, same parents, same way if you're born of God through Jesus Christ, God gave you eternal life and you received it and Christ is your personal savior, you are born again. But you may be in the church. You may be going to the church. You may sing hymns to the church. You may dance in the church. But if you have not actually, personally accepted Christ and trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you may be churchgoer or worship attendant, a member of the church, but you are not born again yet. This you have to understand, particularly pastors should understand that. Pastors are, are happy whenever he has, many people come to you, come to your church, attend your church. They're very happy. And when numbers increase, number, numbers grow, you are very happy, but don't be that happy until they hear you preaching the gospel and they understand it. They meet face to face with Jesus Christ and accept him as their personal savior and the Lord until they receive salvation and born again. They are not the families of God yet. Even if they are there, right there with you, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in a Christian home and grew up uh, in, a, in a Christian family. And I went to church all my life. And I attended uh, Sunday school, memorized a lot of verses, and I knew a lot of hymns, and uh, I never missed the church. But you know, to confess to you, I did not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. I heard about Jesus, I called Jesus, I sang about Jesus, but me and Jesus Christ relationship, I didn't know, I didn't quite understand because I was just a member of the church. But I thank God when I was uh, 25 years old, for the first time, I understood the gospel. First time I understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, what God has done for me through Christ. And I saw my, my eyes open, my ears open, my minds open. And I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal savior, not, well, he is the savior of the world, but what is that for me, savior of the world? My savior, that's the important thing. He is the savior of the world, but more importantly, my personal savior, and I became, I, I, I feel I was born again when I was at the age of 25. This is important. And pastor may like to see a lot of people coming to, but a lot of people come, a lot of people will be saved. They must be born again into God's family. This is one of our greatest tasks because Jesus came to save the sinners. Jesus came to save his people from their sin. So salvation must be clearly understood and salvation, you say each one of them, every one of them, even your family, you may be, you may have about three or four children of yours as a pastor. But that doesn't mean they are spiritual members of the family. You know, one day I went to, uh, <clears throat> well, where was it? Uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, oh, Kazakhstan, and with my uh, members of my fam, uh, my church, and then I also took with me the elementary student, fifth grader or sixth grader who are trained in Kids E, Children's Evangelism Explosion. 
And I wanted to, uh, these children, present the gospel to missionary kids' children, miss missionaries' children. You know, to my surprises, quite a few of those missionary kids were not saved. When our church presented to them, it was the first time they clearly understood the gospel of Christ. And then missionary kids be accepted Christ. And some of them did not. And, and just uh, they, 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 were, they frowned upon the, uh, the, our kids who was presenting the gospel. But many of them accepted Christ and they were born again, even if they were missionary kids. This is very, very important. Gospel is important. Jesus Christ is important. Salvation message is important. So we pastors must make sure, even if there are a lot of people out there in the congregation, you always have to think that someone out there is not saved. So you continue to preach or continue to meet individually as a group and make sure that everyone understand gospel and know Jesus Christ and they are born again. That is our major, the most important uh, ministry we have to do. So you're born again. It's, it's, it's very simple because you understand gospel and Jesus Christ and you accept it, you're born again. <clears throat> but the fact that you're born does not mean you're a college student. Baby has to grow day by day. We have to put them through step by step, little by little, they have to grow. The growth, spiritual growth is called <clears throat> sanctification. Being sanctified from the world, set aside from the world, set aside from our sin, and we need to grow little by little. <clears throat> uh, when I first went to United States to uh, study, uh, I and my family went to a shopping center, and uh, I'm a Korean, and there's one old man, at that time I was, uh, I think I was maybe 30 years old or 30, 30 years old, at 29 or 30. And uh, one American old man with white hair at the uh, shopping center, they saw me and they approached me. He approached me and he says, uh, are you a Christian? Yes. So I knew what he was asking. So I said, yes, sir, I am a Christian. Then he says, are you a born again Christian? Wow, I really appreciate it very much. Are you a born again Christian? He says, yes, yes, sir. I am a born again Christian. I have Jesus Christ in my heart. I was able to say that because I had that experience of personally trusting Jesus Christ for my salvation, you know. So you're born and you need to grow. You grow spiritually, that is internally. Inside of you, start growing. You eat and drink and, and you sleep and rest and uh, you uh, are loved by your parents and so on and so forth and you start growing. This is, is the uh, next step after salvation. My salvation is very simple and sometime a moment or two or one day, even if sometimes some people don't know when they are saved, but they have a clear confession of faith on salvation. It's very, in a way, very simple. There is nothing we can do about salvation. We just thank God for it. But sanctification is work of the Holy Spirit. This is not that simple. Salvation, you start as you're born again. And from then on, you start growing up. This is the, throughout your life, 
for the rest of your life. And all the time you're growing and growing and growing. You're changing, you're change, you, you get transformed. You, you, you're changing everything of your life. Internal change come. The transformation come and begin to get mature little by little and you become a good mature Christian. That's what just spiritual uh, uh, growth. It starts inside, but eventually it goes outside. It, it is expressed. People can see you, not only your change, your transformation, but also they can see your work as well. So spiritual growth is in, in the uh, internal growth. Now, there are two aspects of growth. One is, I call it negative growth. I don't know if this is right expression or not, but uh, negative growth, what I mean by that is that, you know, like First Peter chapter two, verse one, laying aside all malice, all deceit, and all the evil things. There is a hundred of different sins we have. And we have to put aside that dimension, evil dimension is eliminated one by one in that sense, negative growth. So once one in one sense, the old man dies and new man grows. Old uh, sinful qualities sinful dimensions and thoughts and words and behaviors and attitude removed. And then new positive growth has to take place. And we have to, pastors have to make sure that our ministries to do this. And when you begin to see that happen to your people, you are excited, you are so happy that you are uh, a pastor, you are called you know, to pastor a church. So positive past the growth, Galatians 2, 20, 2, 3, but the fruit of the spirit, this begin to show in life. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, fullness, gentleness, and self-control. It says that it's a nine fruit of the spirit, but actually, if you study carefully, if you study the entire Bible about the spiritual growth, it's not just nine spiritual growth. I just I discovered there's this 49 qualities, 49 spiritual qualities of sanctification, positive growth. Your thoughts, you start with your thoughts. And then you also change your words. And then you change, you are changing emotionally and you are changed uh, intellectually and uh, you are changing, mm, you know, relationally and your character changes, your habit changes. There's so many things to change. This is the this is the agony we have. But how the Holy Spirit will begin to work in you and you continue to grow. So I call this uh, spiritual growth, uh, positive growth. Uh, in order for us to positively grow, what what should we do? Daily walk with Jesus. Daily walk with Jesus. When we invite Jesus Christ, Jesus come into our heart. That moment, Holy Spirit comes in within me. Unless Holy Spirit work in my life, my heart, my mind, and to me, I won't accept Jesus Christ. Without the Holy Spirit, without the Spirit, we cannot change, we cannot accept Christ. Holy Spirit work on you, then you open your heart and mind and, and, and uh, your mouth and you accept Jesus Christ. So that time on, 
Jesus is in you. I in you and you in me, Jesus said. Then I also will send uh, another, another comforter to you and he will come and he will uh, be in you, he will dwell in you. So Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit are in our hearts. Jesus said, I will never leave you or save you. I will never leave you or save you. He will be with you forever, Jesus said. So once you become a Christian, you know, once uh, someone become Christian, then he start walking with Jesus Christ. But in order for him to grow spiritually, he has to walk with Jesus every day. Now, sometimes we call this uh, uh, quiet time. You start uh, with Jesus, you end with Jesus. When you wake up, you have time talking to him, listening to him, and then you, you know, your the, a daily life, whatever you do, you talk to God, you talk to Holy Spirit, you talk to Jesus. Just your life is life, entirety of your life is the spiritual growth. The, the spiritual life that is. And Jesus is called the truth. I am the truth. And uh, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And often I wondered about that passage, John 14, uh, 6. And I begin to meditate on that. Uh, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. This in Greek language, there are two negatives. No man. But there are two, in Greek, Greek word, there is two negatives. If there is a two negatives together, it is a positive. So if I translate that into another uh, uh, way, it says, everyone can come to the Father through me from now on. There's a nobody exempt, nobody's rejected, door is open. Heaven's those wide open, and all of you can come now. Jesus paid, paid it all. This is the will of God for you to be saved. So uh, you are to walk with Jesus every day. And if there's anything, any, any agony, uh, you talk to Jesus. And if you, if you need any kind of help, Jesus, the Holy Spirit is, is in us to help us. Now, remember, uh, the Holy Spirit is called uh, Parakletos, uh, which means uh, the helper. I think uh, a new, new international version translated well. He is the, the helper. Why is he called helper? Because we need help. We still have sin nature, we still struggle. We are limited person. There are things we cannot do. Well, we need help. Where do you get the help? You ask the Holy Spirit to help you. You know, these days, um, I uh, it's just short prayer, but I pray a lot uh, because of my, my wife. My wife forgot, uh, she's been healthy all along, all, all her life, but uh, last year she began to develop something. I didn't know what it was. And, and uh, finally uh, we found out that it was a Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a, gener a degenerative uh, illness and it, it never get better. It get worse and worse as days go by. Parkinson's disease get bad, worse and worse and worse. And then you cannot walk and just all physical functions deteriorating. 
and uh, I live with my wife. And I tried to help her. And it was uh, very, very difficult. Uh, you know, in your ministry, you've been ministering to the world and whole world and so many nations probably I, I tried to serve. I don't know how many countries I've been to, probably 60, 70 countries in the world, you know, world evangelism. Well, I lived in the United States and, and I thought about uh, Korean immigrant churches and I worked, I did my best traveling all over the place to help the Korean immigrant churches. And I came back to Korea and I was everywhere and uh, I worked hard and just going everywhere. So worldwide, United States and Korean churches, and now we want to help this North and South be unified. And this is a major work and I, I've tried to help North Korea as much as possible to get an opportunity to uh, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which was not possible in North Korea. Now, I've been a professor at uh, a theological university. I've been pastor and I served uh, Asia uh, as a chairman of the Asian Evangelical Alliance and Asian Theological uh, Association, Theological World, as well as uh, uh, church world. And I had, an, I had privilege to serve World Evangelical Alliance as chairman as well. Well, ministry seems to be expanding and really grow. But now it's no more. Now, just one person, one woman who is ill cannot recover. And I'm alone and I have to, now that pastor became a uh, cook for my wife. I became a nurse to take care of. And I've never done that before. I was always with the people. Here's, here's now, I'm just alone with my wife and try to help. Wow, that was not easy. That was more difficult, more challenge than pastor of a church, a professor of theology, a president of us, our university. It's much, much tougher. Just one woman to care for one person. And I, I begin to feel that uh, I, I just cannot handle this situation. I. I didn't know what to do. So I prayed to the, I prayed to the Lord and Lord help me. My patience is running out. My energy is running out. My mind is running out. And I have to help this wife of mine. You give to me, please help me this, help me that. I just short prayers, yeah. but I've been praying a lot to receive help from the spirit. Sometimes I, I, I get so tired, I didn't know what to do. But if I, when I pray, I can feel that Holy Spirit give me that strength. When I pray, I begin to feel the, the patience will coming back. Well, why did God sent Holy Spirit in our heart because we need help. We are limited for us. Ministry, oh, there's so many people, so many things to do, so much money to, to raise. We need help. You know, when I was uh, going around to preach the gospel in the United States to the Korean immigrant churches. I was just, I, I burned out. 
I no more strength to travel. But I had an appointment. I, I asked them, please, uh, let's cancel this meeting. I says, the pastor says, no, you have promised to write an appointment and we already announced that you have to come here. But I'm, I'm burned out. I have no strength to go. I'm feeling sick. <laughs> then the pastor will say, we will pray for you. God will give you strength. Well, so I pray. I get on a plane. I sat on my seat and I said, Lord, I have no more strength to, to do this three day, you know, seven preachings. I have no strength, Lord. Please help me. Then somehow, I don't know where, but it just comes that just strength come. And I go over there and stand up behind the pulpit, pulpit. I don't know where that, that strength come from. I was lying down before I came, you know. Holy Spirit is there to help. Holy Spirit moved the hearts of the people. Holy Spirit opened the hearts of the people and people accept Jesus Christ and get blessed. We need to walk daily with Jesus. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm all, all of his own. Nobody knows our joy of walking daily, deeply with Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit. As we do so, as we do so, our spirit grows. Spiritually, we grow as we walk. So, Apostle Paul also said, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Jesus Christ. I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I know lives in the body. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. No longer me, Jesus in me, Holy Spirit in me, I and Jesus walk together through the spiritual strength Jesus provide to us. Well, Sanctification start the daily walk with Jesus Christ. Now, this sanctification is daily walk, but this is a progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification means we grow little by little, continuously. When you're born again, you start growing spiritually, Little by little, you read the Bible, you worship, you pray, and, and little by little, you know more and more about Jesus Christ and the Bible. We will be sanctified. We will be sanctified by the word of God. Jesus said in his prayer, John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is the truth, he said. You have to have truth to be sanctified. Without truth, there's no sanctification. What is truth? Jesus gave us definition of the truth. I am the truth. Unless we have Jesus, there's no spiritual growth. Unless we know the word of God, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is the truth. Jesus is truth. And uh, what of God is truth. More we know Jesus personally, more we know the word of God, we will be sanctified. We will change. But it, we don't just uh, grow quickly at one time and just uh, drastically. There's no such a thing. No baby who is born grows. Just go to go to kindergarten and elementary school or junior, senior high or college. Nobody does that. They have to go through the process of the growth. Same way. Spiritually, exactly the same way. We know Jesus 
closely, walk with him daily and more and more. We know the word of God more and more then we grow continuously. Second Peter 3.18 says, grow in grace. It says, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him the glory both and glory both and forever. Grow grace in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't become calistrated immediately. Step by step, little by little, pastor's responsibility to see and help them to grow little by little. More and more about Jesus, more and more about the word of God. More and more about the spiritual life. And, and as we go on, it goes up. And up, it continues to grow upward. But it doesn't go upward. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down, little by little, but still continue to go upward. That's our spiritual growth. Progressive. Continue on. But it's not straight up. Some people think that uh, if you have some kind of a drastic spiritual experience, then you are, you really have it all. No, you don't. What you have is just dynamic spiritual experience. That will help you a little bit of growth, but it doesn't mean you are, you have everything. You are, you are, you are completely sanctified. No such a thing. So if you are a little down today, don't worry about it. You will go up because we have Christ, we have the word of God, we have the Holy Spirit, we have prayer, we will grow, but gradually, upward, little by little. That's what you, what you call it, progressive sanctification, sanctification of the word of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, then what is the ultimate goal of the sanctification? The ultimate goal of spiritual growth is to be conformed to the image of Christ in us. Jesus Christ is our ultimate goal. We'll be like Jesus. We will be like Jesus, little by little, slowly, but gradually, but definitely, we will be more and more like Jesus Christ because we meet Jesus every day. You know, uh, in Korea, uh, the, the daughter-in-law and mother-in-law uh, tradition, it didn't get along too well. They had all kinds of problems. So the daughter-in-law, you know, she cannot do anything because uh, uh, she's uh, your, your mother-in-law. So she says, when I grow older, when I become um, mother-in-law, I will never be like her. I will never be like her. I will not shout like her. I will not uh, act like her. I will not be like, talk like her. <laughs> For 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you know, psychologists uh, prove that uh, you become just like your sister, your mother-in-law, because you've been looking at and thinking about seeing her every day. They, they uh, they implanted into you. Well, if we walk with Jesus, talk to him every day and everything, you always uh, talk to the Holy Spirit. You, you know, you will not get to know more and more Jesus, more and more the word of God. You'll be like it. So it is interesting, you know, you meet someone who you never knew before. When you talk to him about five to 10 minutes, you feel something. You think that, uh, oh, this man must be a Christian because there's an air in that person. Somehow what that person emanate 
remind me of something of Jesus, something of Christian. You know, in Korea, uh, traditionally, Koreans don't drink and don't smoke. That's, that's one of the two, the two of the characteristic of Korean Christians. The non-Christians, when you meet someone to be kind, uh, uh, to be good to the person, they pull out a cigarette and hand out uh, one cigarette. And then it's just a social, social uh, culture. So you accept the cigarette and that's not Christian. But it's, oh, no, thank you. I don't smoke. Most likely Christian, you know? So there's something about that person. Remind me of Jesus Christ. Remind of Christian faith. And you come closer and close to Jesus, live with Jesus, walk with Jesus. And you know the truth, Jesus. You know the truth, the word of God. Then you change inside. Your thinking change. You have your own thoughts, which you have been thinking, which you have learned from your parents or your teachers or books or, or movies or magazines. All kinds of thoughts are in you. But when you become Jesus Christ, when you become a Christian, you notice that uh, you have something which is not biblical, not spiritual, not good. So you get that out of there, that thoughts, you move, you get rid of it, you replace it with the biblical truth. So there is a transform of your mind and thinking. You know, Romans 12, do you remember? It says, be it transformed by the renewal of your mind, he says. Mind, thought pattern, thinking has to change. Thinking with good, not thinking with evil. So, as you change, you become more and more like Jesus Christ. There are some people who remind other people of Jesus Christ. Christ-like person. That's the spiritual growth. That's the ultimate goal. Being like my pastor is not the ultimate goal. So <laughs> sometimes uh, younger pastors uh, uh, imitate uh, their, uh, their respecting uh, pastor, their own pastors. Even sometimes they talk like their pastor and act like pastor, their pastor, a famous pastor. That's not our goal. Our goal is we talk like Jesus, think like Jesus, act like Jesus, live like Jesus, heal like Jesus. That's, that's what we are to be. And that's the goal. If that the image of Jesus can be formed within us, we have to think all the time. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Would Jesus like it? You know, uh, you have you have Christ in you, and uh, every morning uh, you 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 talk with Jesus, and He's in the living room in your in your living room and uh, you used to talk and one day you were just passing you you're so hurried you just get get out of your house and uh, without talking to Jesus Jesus said oh, well stop right there you you didn't see me today where are you going well actually you're going somewhere where Jesus would not go. So, oh Lord, uh, you you cannot come with me here. This the place I go to. Where is it? Well, I, I can't tell you, but you cannot come with me. And then you stay home, and I'll I'll be back soon. Jesus said, No, I'm gonna go with you. You and I, I'm in your house. I'm in your heart. I go always go. Where are you heart, I go. Well, yeah. If if that's the case, I'm not going to go. Well, we walk Jesus. Ultimately, 
because we've been together all the time and all the time with the word, our thought, our words, our thinking, our mind, our attitude, our emotions, our habits, our character will change, transformed, sanctified. Now, Romans 8, 29, so also those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, you know. So ultimate goal of sanctification is not knowing the entire Bible. I memorized, uh, I, I memorized the uh, entire uh, Gospel of Matthew. Well, that's wonderful. I memorized the entire uh, Book of Romans. Oh, that's a great, wonderful. Well, that will help, but that's not the goal. The goal is to be like Jesus Christ, to be like the Bible teaches, okay? So that's our ultimate goal of our spiritual life. All right, now you're saved, born again. That's a point of your life, but Spiritual growth is just continuing on progressively, little by little, up and down and still going up or up, but walking with Jesus and knowing the word of God, which is the tool of sanctification in the Holy Spirit, and through prayers and worship and praises, we constantly change. Then salvation that I'm saved, I'm getting sanctified, it's for me. Christian faith is not for me just to be saved and get sanctified and finish. And, and the end of it, that's not it. Why am I saved? Why am I sancti getting sanctified? There's one more thing that is service. Service. Salvation, sanctification, and service. Three aspects. It all start with S, right? Salvation, S. Sanctification, S. Service, S. I call this 3S theology. 3S theology. Basically, ministry is 3S. Salvation, preach the gospel. You know, Jesus is, Jesus is, he was uh, going around the, all the villages. What did he do? He was teaching, preaching, and healing. Three things, threefold ministry of Jesus Christ. He preached the word of God so that they become children of God. And then they teach them to sanctify it. And then as a result of that, they have grown now they become college student, they have college graduate, now they become adult spiritually. Now they can serve, they do work. Hmm. To Jesus, it was healing work, not only healing, but hundred different things he did. But Matthew chapter four, verse 23 says, preaching, teaching, and healing. Preaching is teaching for me. Healing is others. Jesus, heal the sick. And uh, uh, kick the demon out of the people. Raise the debt. That's, that's the third aspect. People who know Jesus. And know the word of God and grow and become mature and they become servant. They serve others. You serve God. You serve the church. You serve your family. You serve your neighbors. And you serve the whole world. That's what you call world evangelism, world missions. We are to serve, humbly serve, gratefully serve God and church and our family and, and uh, our neighbors. 
as well as the whole world. This is what we do. So what do you do in service? Jesus said, Jesus healed the sick, all kind of sickness. Now, how is man sick? Man is sick from the top of the head to the sole of the foot. There's nothing is sound, nothing is healthy. Your head, your eyes see evil things. You speak mouth out of mouth, it's like a tomb. Your neck is stiff and, uh, and resistant in your hand to all kinds of evil things. Your heart is already uh, uh, hardened and you walk where you go, where you, sh you shouldn't go from the top of the head to the sole of the foot, there's no place that is sound. All sick need healing. Your soul need healing through salvation in Jesus Christ. Your mind need healing, your thinking, your thought pattern, uh, your, your ideology, your, 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 your values need to be changed through the scripture, which is the truth. We need to change little by little everything we have to change so that we become good adults, strong adults, but a sound mind, sound body, sound spirit, and mature person. If anybody meet us, they receive some kind of help. If a troubled person meet a pastor, mature pastor, quickly receive peace through the conversation or through prayers, through the word of God. So there is a many area of service. This is called Jesus. Jesus called them good works, he says. Now, uh, Apostle Paul also said that uh, um, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Works is activity, like uh, uh, children grow as they grow, they move and they act and they play uh, footballs and they, they play all kinds of things and they use their hands and feet created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance to us to do. Even if you just uh, think, think good things, whatsoever is good, whatsoever. Whatever we do, anything we do, because we are mature people, full of Jesus Christ, fullness of Christ, the statue of Jesus Christ, and the scripture for a person, a spiritual mature person. Now, whatever we do, we say something, it's a blessing. We preach the gospel, people get saved. People who are sick, we pray for them, they get healed. Who are downtrodden, we pick them up. And we are the helpers. Holy Spirit is the helper, and we are the helpers too. So world needs us. World needs us. John 14, 12 says, most assuredly I say unto you, he who believes in me, the believers, right? Believers, great faith. The works that I do, he will do also. Greater works than these things he will do because I go to the Father. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will send another helper that he may abide with you forever. You know him or he dwells with you. He will be in you. This is a very interesting passage. Now look at this. 
he who believes in me, me is Jesus, right? So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you do what Jesus has been doing. He says, the work that I do, what Jesus do, you do. How do we know that we are Christian? How do we know we are disciples of Jesus Christ? People will see I do what Jesus has been doing. Okay? Also, greater works than these. I was, I've been troubled with this, this phrase. Oh, how can I do greater works than, than Jesus? I mean, there's no way I can do it. But what does he mean greater works than I? This? Does he mean that I can raise dead anybody, any, any dead person? No. I, I, I finally uh, became comfortable with the expression is greater works in that. Now, Jesus served only three years. Now, how many years have you served? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 10 times more than Jesus did. That's a great work. Now, Jesus never troubled uh, out of Israel. Just, you know, Galilee and Jerusalem, Galilee and Jerusalem, back and forth three times, and he was gone. But you, you travel more wider and longer. You do more areas of ministry. And you do. In that sense, I take that as a greater work than these. He will do. The believers will do what Jesus was doing. What did Jesus do? Salvation, sanctification, and service. Preaching, teaching, and healing. Okay. And uh, why uh, Jesus asked us to do it? He says, uh, because I go to the Father. He says, now, I've been doing these three type of ministries, preaching, teaching, and healing, but now I'm going back to my father. So I won't be doing it on earth as new, anymore. So since I'm going away, from now on, you who believes in me, you do it in my place. That's you and I. Uh, you are doing it in Africa, in Kenya, I'm doing in Korea. That's who we are. We are the believers. So we do what Jesus was doing, preaching, teaching, and healing. That's what we are doing, you know. So we help people. We help people spiritually healed, intellectually healed, emotionally healed, and uh, physically healed, and environmentally healed, and character healing, and, and they become a different person because we help them. You know, when they're discouraged, we help them. That's right. So we do what Jesus has been doing. Yeah. We, we do, do what Jesus has been doing uh, before. So he says, what you, you ask anything in my name. What does that mean? When you do it, do it in prayer. Okay. Ask anything in my name, I will do it. So we ask Jesus to do it in me. And, uh, and then also I will send the Holy Spirit. You, you ask help from the Holy Spirit because he, you need help. And so he will be with you and be forever with you. Okay. So here we can do, we can do service as a servant of God, servant of the people, Servant of anyone around us, my family, we are the servant. We will do what Jesus has been doing. And also, we will do it in prayer. And we will do it with the help of Jesus Christ. I mean, the, uh, we will do help with the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, finally, I think uh, my time is... Um, uh, Going down, and uh, let me go down to the pastoral ministry. Uh, the John twenty-one church is the temple. 
church is a temple of Jesus, a temple of God, the, the living God. Church will continue to grow, continue to grow. As we do these things, people will come into Jesus. They will grow and uh, they will be trained and pastor will train these people and they will go out, preach the gospel. They will help them to grow and they will also help them to serve others uh, uh, like we, we are doing it. And not only we feed uh, the, uh, the uh, sheep, this is the pastoral work. Jesus said, now, I, I feel that uh, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that Jesus saved me, but I'm more grateful now because salvation was uh, good enough, but God called me to serve him. That's a greater, greater privilege, you know. So we, we do this. So we become pastor and take care of the, uh, the God's people. And now pastor, the church growth grows or decreases depending upon the pastor. Pastor has the strong sense of call as a pastor to do the pastoral work. Strong sense of missions, what to do. Call, call as well as ministry. Sense of call, sense of ministry. We need this and the church will rise and fall with the leaders. And Apostle Paul said to Timothy, be an example to the believers in words, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Now, the important thing is, is be example to the believers. Non-Christians, we are example. But here, those people who are church members, are we the example? of salvation and sanctification and service? Are we following the word of God, walking with Jesus, conforming to the image of Jesus Christ every day? Just be an example, exemplary pastor. Take heed to yourself. You need to take care of yourself first and the teaching. Before teaching, we come before that teaching. This kind of exemplary pastor, when he teaches doctrines, and this is the first, take it yourself first, and then doctrine. Continuing them for in doing this, you will save them, both yourself and those who hear you, says. Now, I wish all of you become a pastor who listen to you, who listen to you, get saved and sanctified and become a good servant because you train them, you show them example and how to do it and so forth. Now, uh, especially when you train, when you train, what you need to do is, uh, I wanna point out four things. It says some pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is, pastor's job is pastor's a teacher. We are trained by the professors, but people are trained by us, pastors and teachers. And you equip them, you train them. To do what? To do the work of ministry. The lay people and us, we do the work of ministry together to edify the body of Christ body of Christ of church, church need to build up. Uh, the church is the temple of the living God and church is getting completed day by day, continue to grow. Grow in Africa, grow in South America, uh, grow in Asia, particularly now. And then anywhere around the world, churches continue to grow. This temple of the living God is continued to will be completed and more and more and more one day, this temple of the living God will be completed. 
grow and grow and grow. Finally completed. That's the day Jesus will come. As second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, what do you train? I want to just mention four things. Now, would you give me a, a one, the last uh, slides? Pace. You, you pray for them. You give your time available. You are the first to contact them. You know what, what's going on. You don't wait until they tell you. You call them and keep the information, and then you set the example. You pray, when you pray, you love start pouring out. So you want to be there with them whenever they need you. And then you constantly, by emails and phone calls and visiting, you are in contact and you know what goes on in the life of your, your people. And you set the example. You love God, you love church, you love prayer, and you love to serve. You're a good example. We train people to be like this, and I do this, and the people do with me. Together, the church will grow and grow, and the temple of God will be completed. And trumpet will sound, and we will go, we will go to heaven. Church will grow with such a pastor. Well, my time passed so fast. Now, I have only a few minutes, and uh, uh, if you have any questions, I would like to hear from you. If anybody like to ask any questions or say what you feel, what you feel after you heard me, uh, my lecture. Any thoughts on you? Um, actually, there's a questions um, in the chat box. Um, the first one, mm -hmm. so is financial growth the most effective parameter to measure the growth of the church? Mm -hmm. Generalize the performance of all other like geographical, numerical, and spiritual? <laughs> okay, <laughs> financial growth. <laughs> That is true. I mean, if um, more people get saved it, in Korea, it, uh, we tithe. Ten percent of our offerings we give with Thanksgiving offerings, all kind of offerings we give, and uh, I think that's a good, good, good way of saying that. The more people, more tithe. Naturally, you know, there was one day uh, uh, my assistant I had when I started a church in. They plant a church. I had only one uh, assistant pastor. And uh, I sent him out to be trained for evangelism uh, uh, explosion. And one week later, he came back and he got so excited that, that when he presented the gospel, people got saved. So he told, was telling me excitedly, oh my, you know, this and that, I'm really ready to go. So, okay. Now, Next, next one here, you reach 10 families. Now I give you know, one family, one family a month. That's not a big job, one family a month. So 12 months, but I give you two months uh, 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 left over, <laughs> just 10 families. He says, now when I said that, <clears throat> if he reaches 10 families, 10 families will come to church one year. You know what? That 10 family will pay his salary. The assistant, assistant pastor's salary. <laughs> Why? 10 people are trained and 10 families are parents. They, they, they give offerings. So church is the best, uh, best, best ma uh, measure of the national finance. Nation is doing well. Next month, next Sunday, there will be more offerings. Nation is bad financially. Church offerings 
you know, drop. So I think, I don't know who said that, but I, I like that. <laughs> that is just natural results of the church growth. Yes, um, another question here. In order to achieve church planting movement, mm -hmm. what factors in process or cycle that needs to be implement, implemented? I, I, I didn't get the question yet. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's what it says. So in, say it again, please. So in order to achieve mm -hmm. church planting movement, mm -hmm. what factors and process or cycle that needs okay. to be implemented? Okay, I, um, I, 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 try, I planted one church. Uh, I met uh, about 30 people and uh, was talking to them. And I found out that half of them are saved and half of them was not, they were just churchgoers. You try to work with churchgoer, nothing much work, <laughs> nothing happens. So I wanted to make sure that all 30 people are saved. So I preached the gospel very, very clearly. And uh, those, the half, the other half, they, for the first time in their life, they heard the gospel clearly about Jesus Christ and salvation. They all accepted Christ. So I had almost 30 people completely saved and born again. Wow, I said. So I got them together on Wednesday night. And usually they have, we Korean church have Wednesday night service. But I didn't want it to have Wednesday night service, the same thing. Uh, Sunday service and Wednesday the same same thing. So I says no. I will train these people, thirty people. If I train these thirty people, they will be the evangelists. They will be the workers. So I started with them two hours uh, every every Wednesday from eight to ten. And I began the basics of Christian faith. I started with salvation, the Bible, the eternal life, and prayer, and uh, and heaven, uh, and earth, uh, he heaven, and the eternal life in heaven, the second coming of Christ, those things, the basic, basic doctrines of Christian faith. I trained eight months, detailed. I really drilled these things into them. They were very, very excited because they never had such a systematic teachings uh, in their life. This is first time ever. So eight months I trained basic Christian faith with the 30 people. I tried to get them ready to work for the Lord, you know, the service. So sanct salvation and sanctification I worked on for eight months. And then last four months I trained them with the gospel of Jesus Christ evangelism, how to witness, how to give the gospel. So whole year, first year, I concentrated on these 30 people, built them up with the basic Christian faith. And they were excited, more they knew, more they got excited, then more strengthened, and then last four months with evangelism. So I had four, I had 30 evangelists with me. First year, I was the only one who knew how to witness. But after one year, I've done eight months of basics and four months of evangelism. I have 30 evangelists in my church. So first year when I baptized someone, he was always the one I led them to Christ. But second year on, you know, these people went out just all over the place and they reach out, they win the souls and they begin to come to Christ and they begin to come to church. Church will really start growing. And I continued, continue, I continued always three things, salvation, sanctification and service. And if someone doesn't know Christ, I make sure that they, heard, they know. And if they can come to Christ, I make sure that they get to train basic training of Christian faith. 
and then Indian evangelism. So I have more and more people like that. So church will just keep on growing. You know, after one year, 30 people became like 150 people. Then on and on and on and on. It just continued to grow because I kept this basic structure of three S uh, ministry. Salvation, sanctification, and service. That's what I did. And then, of course, in order to, to or help them, I have to organize in a small group, a small group, weekly small groups. They get together and they share and they have, have fellowship and they pray together, they work together, and they try to serve together. So I help them to do the ministry. Now, earlier you saw Ephesians chapter 4. They are to do the ministry, the work of ministry. Lay people should be trained by the pastor. They should be able to do work of ministry just like a minister. So they are many lay ministers. I made them, one of them, each one of them ministers, and they did the work. They did the ministry. And that's what happened. They just kept, kept going on. You know, salvation, sanctification, service, one by one, and just kept on growing and growing and growing. When I came back to Korea, I did the same thing. And church just grew and grew and grew. Well, I don't know whether that helps. Yeah, another question. A person may be on a spiritual journey mm -hmm. because of the faith tradition. He or he grew in that did not agree with the faith of Jesus Christ. How can okay. such a person be assisted even before they start teaching others on spiritual growth? Yes, yes. That's the reason why I said you have to have two things. Truth. Truth make you free. Otherwise, the denomination will hold you or, or pastors will hold you. I mean, the theology will hold you. You, you, should, be, you should be in the hand of Jesus Christ and the truth. So only thing you can do is you have to study Bible with them. Not your denomination, not your church, not anybody else. Let the Bible, the word of God, the truth, save them and sanctify them, change them. <clears throat> you know, once uh, someone asked me, um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has salvation? That's a good question. Does Roman Catholic Church have salvation? So I said, uh, does Presbyterian Church have salvation? I asked back, does Baptist Church have salvation? Salvation is from Jesus Christ. It's not the Catholics, not the Episcopalian, not the Anglican, not the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Baptist, not those things. Jesus Christ is the salvation, you know. So if you, if you open the Bible and study it together, let the Bible tell them. Not you, or my, my pastor said, what does that mean? Let the word of God say it. Then he has to deal with the word of God, okay? He has to, he has to work with God, not your denomination. So I have met a lot of uh, Catholic people who came to Jesus Christ in my ministry. And they saw the Bible and they hear the Bible. They, they read their own eyes. They change. Yeah. Okay. And next question is, what is the measure of, of a growing church? Is it spirituality or giving? <laughs> Both of them. <clears throat> you know, you have to teach your people to give. Now, Korean church are well taught. I'm so glad that uh, we do. Majority, in fact, all of the church believes in uh, tithing. You know, uh, it, it's it's not either or; it's a both and end. Yeah, but if you overemphasize giving without emphasizing Jesus Christ or the Bible, you may be in trouble. 
because they will think that you love you love money more than Jesus. <laughs> so you have to be careful. Okay. okay. If anyone wants to ask, let me say, money is the result, but not the goal. Natural result. Okay. All right. Anyone wants to ask any questions or, or share your comments or thought? Well, I must have done well. Nobody has questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, it's right. May I have a prayer uh, with them? Uh, yes. Uh, can you just wait a little bit more? Um, I think um, the leader, she wants to say something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, Reverend Dr. Joseph or Bishop, you want to say um, something to Reverend Dr. Sangbok Kim? Thank you so much, brother. Would like looking at hear us or if the mother's union president can hear us she can also do the same kindly let us know whether the bishop is allowed yeah uh, thank you very much uh, dr mm -hmm. joseph and i appreciate the mm -hmm. teaching that you have received I, I had to go out for a prayer with a family and so i've just now joined back uh once the tail end of the the session, but I must appreciate the insights which have been given and how they impact upon our ministry and uh, the testimonies that are given and the sharing is really inspirational. I pray that uh, you become enthusiastic in reaching out to those who are around us. And even as it was explained that even in a simple airplane travel is an opportunity for witnessing. We give glory to God for all this insight and opportunity. I thank you very much for every participant. We give glory to God for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bishop. Okay, so um, before you go, um, I'll just give you um, a short announcement before um, uh, Reverend Dr. Sangbok Kim end up the session by prayer. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so this conference will continue next week as well. So um, let me just introduce a speaker for next week. So um, Dr. Dieter Kuhl, uh, he'll be speaking on the Islam. Um, as you see, he's the expert. He's very specialized in Islamic study. So he was the former international director of WEC International, and he was a missionary in Indonesia. He was also a medical doctor. And he'll be speaking on uh, Islamic um, Islam or three sessions. So. Um, We'll be starting a little bit earlier, so half an hour, hour earlier, so it'll be starting at 15 past 8, so um, please um, keep your mind and um, log in um, a little bit earlier next week. Okay, so um, Reverend Dr. Kim, can you just end up the set whole session by prayer? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we are grateful that uh, we have Jesus Christ in us and the salvation and the eternal life you have given to us freely, dying on the cross for our sins and forgiving us and opening the door to, to, to heaven for all. And we are very grateful for it. But more grateful uh, is that uh, you have called us to serve you and preach the gospel for salvation and uh, teaching your people for sanctification 
so that just like Jesus served, may we be able to serve and also we train our people to serve like you did. Lord, bless Kenya and Africa and the churches, the pastors, the nation, Lord, that they may go forward, that uh, wherever they go, wherever they are, they always reach out with the Jesus Christ, people coming to Christ. And they really say be born again and sanctified for service. May you bless them. And you bless each pastor in Kenya and the nation and their families. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.